Hello, everybody. Recording live from somewhere. This is Zach Couples with episode number 84 of the Movement Debrief. And tonight, folks, this one is going to be really, really, really good. We're going to talk about collapsed arches. What do you do if your arches are collapsing, your feet getting flat? What you going to do about that? Stay tuned. We're going to talk about rounded back breathing. Is there ever a time or a place in which you should round your back excessively, take some breaths in, and see if that gets you in business? I'll give you the answer. And last but not least, we're going to talk about posture. Can it be changed? Is it worth changing? Does it correlate to pain? Is it important? These are all questions that I'm going to answer for you, beautiful, sexy, outstanding people tonight, because they have been asked by the people. They'll be answered for the people by this people right here, fam recognized fam. Without further ado, let's debrief, shall we? The first question comes from, wow, I don't know who it comes from. I. I, I feel terrible. I've lost. I, his or her name has been lost in translation. So, um, in in cases like this, when I uh, don't have a name, I make up a name, and the name isn't going to be like John or Jill or George. Um, I always found that to be quite silly. So instead, we're going to go with a cool name such as Redman. Redman writes, Zach, I have been enjoying your stuff for about a year or two now. Quick question. Have you done a deep dive into why and how to avoid young athletes, why they might have a collapsing arch? I teach a kid who is a young competitive gymnast who has a right arch, which is collapsing, and has been diagnosed with posterior tibialis damage. Um, the The doctor recommended getting orthotics. They may help while playing other sports or let the posterior tib heal, but what are your thoughts on what to do to mitigate this problem in the future? She has to sit out of gym because of pain. Parents won't go to quality PTs around, sadly, so I'm looking for things she could do in the gym. Redman, excellent question. So let's dive into this. What is a collapsed arch? Well, to the casual observer, a collapsed arch would be a flat foot where the foot is splayed outward. You have a small arch, and... um, A lot of times that can be secondary to some type of issue with the posterior tibialis, which helps um, create that nice arch in your foot. The thing is, though, is there are a couple different ways that you can have a flattening of the foot. You can either have something that happens secondary to the calcaneal position, or you can have something that happens secondary to um, eccentric orientation happening within the midfoot proper. So let's dive into each of those possibilities. First though, we have to understand how the foot works. Generally, if the mid or the, the hind foot, the caneus, inverts or tips inward, the mid and forefoot are locked, so you cannot pronate down. That's useful during the first part of gait because when you land, you want to land with a little bit of a stiffer foot and you don't want to pronate too early. This is supination. So inversion of the calcaneus, mid and forefoot are locked. You can't collapse the arch. During eversion or pronation, as the calcaneus everts, the mid and forefoot are unlocked. So you can allow a natural flattening of the arch to occur which is useful for help, helping dampen forces in things such as gait or, or jumping or anything. So when you, when you walk or you run, there's kind of this normal twisting motion that ought to occur in the foot that is influenced by alternating calcaneal inversion and eversion. So when you step, ideally, you should have calcaneal inversion with a locked mid and forefoot, fall into some eversion, allow pronation to happen, which is when the mid and forefoot unlock, and then you would resupinate to propulse forward. And that's basically what, what the foot does when you're walking. Now, if I have an individual who at their default positioning is with a everted calcaneus, then the foot is going to appear to be flattened, and the arch will appear to be collapsed. This can happen for a multitude of factors. Likely, in, in my biased opinion, 
the flattening of the or the calcaneus falling into eversion likely is a secondary thing from something going on proximally. Um, for example, if the foot or if the hip is in more of an abducted orientation, the foot is of course going to be a bit more pronated because as I pronate or as I if I pronate my foot and I keep pronating, 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 my hip is going to be more abducted. So if that is your starting orientation, chances are you're probably going to have an everted foot. This can be one way that you could have a collapsed arch. Another way is if the calcaneus is stuck in inversion and you still have to pronate, what can happen sometimes is the first ray or the, the area of the big toe can drop down to try to create or try to touch the ground, which this also could potentially flatten the arch. So what happens is you have a locked calcaneus in the inversion. The forefoot and midfoot should be in a locked position and not be able to collapse down and pronate, but you still got to walk, you still got to move. This could be a compensatory strategy to fall or not fall too far into calcaneal in, inversion because that could be at risk for an ankle sprain or something. So the big toe would drop down in this case. That could also give the appearance of a flat foot. Either of those two situations requires different treatment modalities. Because what I generally do, one of my rules of thumb that I teach at my seminar, Human Matrix, stay tuned, we'll talk later, is you want to put people in the positions that they can't get into or the positions that they struggle to, to be in. So for the person who is in calcaneal eversion, you probably want to do things that are more towards the inversion side of things to neutralize or put the, the foot in a more neutral uh, position, like subtalar neutral is what I'm talking about. If I have someone who is inverted and they are doing a compensatory first ray plantar flexion or dropping down the first ray, that person you probably want to actually pronate the foot or evert the calcaneus because what that would do is that would allow that foot to collapse naturally into an arch as opposed to doing it compensatorily through the midfoot. How do you drive that? Obviously you can do things locally at the foot but much of this also has to be driven from up higher. As I had mentioned previously, if I continue to pronate my foot, my hip is going to be more abducted. And conversely, if I supinate the foot, my hip is going to be more in an adducted position. That's assuming, of course, there's no compensatory things that happen at the, uh, at the tibiofemoral joint or the knee joint. But your first line of defense, regardless of what's going on there, is to address the, the hips and the ventral cavity, in my opinion. In order for this to happen, you have to look at hip range of motion, figure out where they're limited. For example, if someone can't abduct or adduct, you should probably do things to take care of that. And I have a gang of stuff that I've listed in, in uh, the past. I will link um, a uh, debrief I did on hip adduction and abduction um, that I think is pretty solid. So I think that's really the, the big first key that you need to do in order to get this foot into the orientation you so desire. Because you could do all the things you want at the foot. You can put orthotics in like this physician recommended. But if that individual doesn't know how to place the rest of their body in a manner that takes advantage of the orthotic orientation, you're probably not going to get the outcome that you desire. So first line of defense you have to do is restore ventral cavity orientation. Make sure hip mobility is is adequately taken care of. I can, uh, I'll link a couple of videos of some stuff that I like to use if I'm going to improve hip adduction or abduction. Um, let me link some exercises for that as well in the show notes, which will be available on zackcouples.com either tonight or tomorrow, most likely tomorrow. Uh, that would be one thing. The next thing, you, would, you could progress that by taking whatever hip position you so desire to change uh, foot position. So in the cases that I've mentioned, if, if I need to drive pronation of the foot, I can use hip abduction to reinforce that, and vice versa. If I need to drive calcaneal inversion, I likely want to do things that involve hip adduction. So combining moves with the foot orientation that you're trying to drive can be incredibly useful. Now the last part of this question that Redman asked was, are orthotics useful? 
And if you have someone with a legit laxity, they can't, despite your best efforts of what you're doing hip-wise, you can't seem to get reliable changes. Yeah, I think that they could potentially be useful. They may help the, the foot get into a position that it might not normally be capable of, of doing so. But I rarely think it's a forever thing that you need to utilize orthotics to place the foot where it needs to go. But they can be a useful thing to also help sense things up higher that you need to be able to do in order to restore movement options. What I do think is risky is having the orthotics be used in all contexts. Because many times when a podiatrist or whoever is making the orthotics is measuring that individual, they are either non-weight bearing or they're just weight bearing in the seated position, which is what the, uh, the uh, podiatrist is that I use, or they're walking. I, I, when I was in the NBA, we had a podiatrist who had like the, the heat map sensors as he was working with his people. And that um, was how he measured for his orthotics. But those are just one context. We don't know if that's what that individual is doing when they're sprinting, when they're playing basketball, or in the case of, of your athlete, when they're doing gymnastics. Because the, the foot will likely change its relative orientation depending on intensity. Because the body has to move differently and has to self-organize differently. So it's a unwise assumption to say that because the foot is flat in one instance means that's going to be flat in all instances, thus requiring the same orthotic across all these cases. So my, my thought process with utilizing orthotics is I want to use as little as humanly possible and eventually wean that individual off orthotic use if indicated. But what I've found over the last several years as I've, um, as I've refined my approach, as I've mastered the basics even better than I had in the past, which wasn't very good because I would skip to a lot of this fancy stuff, I have very rarely prescribed orthotics for someone even if they had a flat foot or crazy bunions. You would be amazed at how well the rest of the body can compensate despite some of those structural adaptations. And I think that's something that we, as movement professionals, neglect. And that's, we jump to a lot of these, not invasive interventions, but more expensive interventions that are oftentimes wholly unnecessary. So what I recommend is you address some of those basic things that I, I had stated, if you need orthotics, use them not liberally, but in specific situations in which you've exhausted all other options and you think maybe this is useful. And if once you've done that, I think you eventually want to wean them off and progress accordingly. And if you do those things, well, you might not completely change the foot orientation of that individual. You'll most likely get them out of pain and you could probably get them back to performing at the level that they so desire. And just because they have a flat foot or a collapsed arch in one context, does not mean that that is true across the board when it comes to movement. So, Redman, unbelievable question. Let's move on. The next question comes from my man, Dustin, and he types. So, I understand that if the sternum is dropped or depressed, the rectus abdominis, your six-pack muscle, is concentrically oriented. But is there a time when you would do an exercise like a, like a turtle back child's pose breathing, meaning the back is um, excessively rounded? For example, someone who can't touch toes and is a wide infrasternal angle, I'll link that in the show notes if you don't know what that is. Since a wide infrasternal angle is inhaled bucket handle and pump handle position, could an exhaled uh, sternal position help? Could that rounded position also act as a restraint to get them to feel posterior expansion later, progressing to your sternum, not drop position? Dustin, great question. So what Dustin is referring to is, is utilizing a posture where I'm getting excessive rounding through the, the thorax useful for driving air posteriorly, especially in cases where maybe I have really good anterior chest wall expansion? And the short answer for, for our intents and purposes, Dustin, is no. And here's why that I, I believe that's the case. We have to first understand 
what are normal mechanics of the upper thorax. Ideally, you want to see multi-directional expansion of the thorax every time you inhale and then multi-directional compression as you exhale. So what that looks like is the rib cage should expand laterally and superiorly. This is the bucket handle action. You should see the front part of the rib cage move anteriorly and superiorly. The pump handle action. What up, Aaron? And then lastly, you should see the posterior thorax move posteriorly and superiorly, which is posterior expansion. All of these things occurring simultaneously. You'll also get a degree of elevation because the scalenes are a primary muscle of inspiration, so you kind of get this stretching effect of the thorax. And it will also stretch downward because of the um, line of pull of the internal obliques. So that's what normal looks like. And that's what we're striving for when we are giving some of these breathing interventions to our people. If you do a turtle shell position, what's going to happen is you will not get that anterior posterior expansion that we're looking for, the combined pump handle and posterior expansion, because the orientation of the thorax has changed. When the sternum is depressed, because I'm compressed on the front side, I can't adequately fill in the upper thorax. So instead what's going to happen is you're going to get mid to lower thorax expansion and you won't get the stretching in the upper thorax orientation because it's a higher pressure, uh, intrathoracic pressure situation in the upper thorax when I compress one side of it to the degree that you're talking about. So then the only place that I can expand in this case, because I've essentially, because the sternum won't do the normal pump handle action, because you're getting rectus, you're not going to get the, the posterior expansion because you've essentially sealed off the upper thorax in that case. So the only thing that you can do is breathe posteriorly into the mid to lower thorax region, which if my goal is to get multi-directional expansion in the upper thorax, it's, it's undesirable. And you can even try it. I want you to, all of you, go ahead and slouch, tense up your rectus, and then breathe in and see where you get that stretch to happen. And what you'll find is it's probably going to be in that mid to lower thoracic region. What we want instead is we want to see between the scapula around T2 to T7 expand because that correlates with what we should see expanding with the pump handle mechanism. The way to do that is not doing excessive rounding, but it's to ensure that you are keeping the, the, the sternum not in a depressed position, but almost if you're facing a wall, parallel to the wall, and then breathing in that position. Because what that does is, instead of sealing off the upper thorax, while I might be a little bit more concentric in the anterior chest wall, I have a more normal relationship or orientation between the sternum and the posterior thorax, thus allowing for me to better expand posteriorly. Um, so that's typically what we cue. We want the roundedness to come from air, not necessarily me trying to create that orientation actively or passively. So to summarize your question, Dustin, I don't advocate a turtle shell because when you down the pump handle, you do not get um, access to the upper thorax when you breathe in because the pressure is too great. You can't push air there, so instead it has to descend to the mid to lower thoracic region. Ideally, what you want to do when you're coaching breathing such as this is you want to keep the sternum parallel to whatever, whether it's a wall or the ground, as you're reaching. While that will close off the pump handle to some degree, it will at least allow it because the sternum is not depressed in this case or, or bent. Um, and because under normal respiratory conditions, you want to see a multi-directional expansion of the upper thorax, by allowing the pump handle mechanism to occur, you can encourage that posterior thorax expansion simultaneously. And if you do those things, that's going to create some normal rounding in the upper thorax, and it'll put you in business. So Dustin, great question. Before I dive into this last doozy of a question, if you want to learn how to apply those concepts with your people and um, you want to see if that can possibly improve someone's ability to press if you're a trainer 
or maybe it helps them with their neck pain as a, as a rehab clinician, then you probably want to come to Human Matrix. We had an outstanding showing um, in, uh, in, uh, in San Antonio this past weekend. We had about 20, 26 people, and we had a really good group. I really like where the seminar is at right now, and I may have done a little something, something while I was there for uh, when the online version comes out. So just a heads up on that. But if you want to learn more and you want to come to one of these, I would say come to New York June 8th and 9th, but that sucker sold out. So uh, you can get on the wait list, though. I will make sure that that is linked in the show notes. Um, otherwise, though, I have August 3rd and 4th in Cincinnati, Ohio. I have August 24th and 25th in Vancouver, B.C. I have September 21st and 22nd in Raleigh, North Carolina. I have October 5th and 6th in Boston, Massachusetts. And last but not least for this year, I got December 7th and 8th in Orlando, Florida. So you probably want to sign up ASAP because these puppies are filling up right quick. And I don't want to have you miss another sellout crowd for the several people who are going to be attending these things. So... I hope to see you there. Without further ado, the last question comes from my dude, Andrew. And he types, What is the importance, if any, of posture? If possible, how can you change posture? I place little importance on it regarding pain, but I'm actually wondering for my own forward head and kyphosis, Largely because I think it looks bad aesthetically. LOL. Andrew, good question. This is a tough one. We'll see if I can give it a go. Uh, so let me, let me break this question down step by step. What is the importance of any if of posture? So, well, what is posture? That's a doozy of a question. I, I would say posture is, is, from what I see, is any type of orientation you're giving at one set point in time. Um, so me sitting like this, I'm using a specific posture if you were to freeze frame me right now. And that's hopefully continually changing as I'm moving around and grooving. So what is the importance of it? Well, from a survival perspective, posture is probably important to a degree because it's allowing us to do the tasks that we need to do and however our body has decided to organize ourselves in that regard. I would agree with Andrew to a point in that it's probably not that important regarding pain unless, my caveat is, unless it is important. So there's a lot of research out there showing that posture and pain do not necessarily correlate. But if having your body in a certain orientation is painful and then you change that orientation and it's no longer painful, then in that case, posture probably does matter. For example... If I am someone who has a forward head posture and I stay like this for an extended period of time, and the key, and this is, for my opinion, the key with posture, is if I can't reverse that or change that, for example, if I am in OA extension and I can't do any OA flexion, then what may happen is I may get compression of the tissues in the posterior neck. When that happens, and I have compression or a lack of movement, whether it's concentric or eccentric, the tissues become ischemic. If tissues become ischemic, meaning they're not getting adequate blood flow, that could potentially lead to nociceptors activating, which are your noxious stimuli sensors in your body. Those could send signals up to your brain and produce pain. This is a legit phenomenon. I'm not making it up. And you can look and read about this stuff in any of your pain gurus. Um, you know, David Butler talks about tissue, tissue ischemia, which if you don't know who that is, shame on you. I'll link it in the show notes. But he talks extensively about tissue, tissue ischemia in many of his books, especially the sensitive nervous system, which is one of the best books ever. Um, you definitely want to check that out. And I did a whole uh, review on that way back when in the early blog days, so I'll make sure to link that as well. So... In that case, if your posture in this forward head position is all you got and you can't reverse it, then it probably does matter and it probably is important for someone in pain. But the problem is that some people do have a degree of reversibility in that regard and that's probably why we don't have that correlative capability. 
So that, that would be my first thought on, on posture. And it could be important in that regard. Um, and also, it's interesting, Andrew, what you say is you're saying that your forward head and kyphosis look bad aesthetically. So if that's potentially influencing your self-image, maybe it's that you're in, influencing your ability to attract the mates you want. Um, like sexual selection is a thing, fam. Then maybe posture is important. Maybe being in this slump position is not necessarily desirable in that regard, and it does it does not look aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing. And maybe it would behoove you to change that to some degree in order to look more aesthetically pleasing. If we've decided that whatever body orientation you have is not so. So even within this, Andrew we could see that there are probably some importances in regards to posture. For some people, it may influence pain. For others, um, maybe it is an aesthetic thing and you need to, to uh, change that. So that's what I would recommend in, in that regard. As I was saying, posture could be important for pain, could most certainly be important for aesthetics. Um, the, the big key or the big question with this is, is this something that we can change? Um, and what I would say, Andrew, in that regard is, uh, I think to a degree, and I, and I've, I've said in the past that is probably not something we can change, but interestingly enough, and I'll link this in the show notes, I have a picture of myself from, this would have been like early 20, it would probably have been like 2010 compared to how I look now, a side profile. And... I would have to say that my posture or the, uh, the orientation that I am standing in in both of these pictures looks fairly different, especially in the lower back region. And because of that, um, I, I kind of reverse this. I, I think that you probably can, to a degree, change posture. Uh, because the key, the key but with posture or being able to change posture whatsoever is making sure that you have movement options available. If, in, as I had mentioned previously, in the case of the person with forward head who maybe has neck pain, if that's the only strategy that they have available and they can't go the other way, then that's a problem. And of course, their posture is not going to be able to change. While you may be predisposed to a particular body orientation, if you can increase the options available to you, movement-wise, then I don't see why you, you could make some degree of a change in the way that your body defaultly stands, sits, or whatever. And it's not necessarily you st sitting chest up, shoulders back. It's making sure that you increase your joint range of motion at all of your respective joints. And by doing that, perhaps your body will naturally be accustomed to find a new middle ground that it would stand, sit, or, or be in. We, we can change our bodies quite a bit. You can add muscle, you can add fat if you so desire, and you can adapt the tissues in many different ways. And, and I don't see why posture couldn't fit into that category, as a category of something that we could change to a degree. Now that being said, you're probably not going to make large sweeping changes in your normal body posture. If you are a forward head kind of person, and you're, you're, you're probably not going to make yourself into a flat back military type posture. On the flip side, someone who's in that flat back military type posture is probably not going to do the converse. Just like a marathon runner is probably not going to be a great power lifter, and vice versa. So I think we have to appreciate that we may not be able to make large changes in our posture, especially as we age and there's more structural adaptations. But if you can improve the amount of options available to you movement-wise, you probably can make changes. So to summarize your wonderful question, Andrew, um, I think posture is important. Um, I think that and the way I define posture is an orientation of your body in any given point in time. I think that it can matter in cases of pain if the posture is related to pain. It isn't always the case. And most certainly, I think we would both agree, Andrew, that posture can be related to aesthetics to a degree. Can you change posture? I would argue probably. 
I got some pictures of me. I'm going to link in the show notes showing some differences over the years, um, showing that it does change to a degree, but it's probably not the big sweeping changes that we um, think. The way I would advocate for changing it is by making sure you have all of your movement options available. Can you move all your joints in the ranges of motion that are available at those joints? And that would be probably the most important factor. And lastly, I would say, is there one good posture or a bad posture? No. The best posture is one that's constantly changing, that's constantly adaptable. A body that we can constantly morph into various different um, orientations and states and I think that's really what you ought to be striving for and see if that leads to the changes that you're looking for so great question Andrew I think that's a good stopping point for us tonight I want to thank you all for tuning in you've been beautiful sexy outstanding people apologize about the technical difficulties not sure what happened but if you want to find more about Big Z I would go to zackcouples.com there you can subscribe to my newsletter. You're going to get about five hours of me talking, a free acute to chronic workload calculator. And last but not least, you're going to get weekend learning goodies every Friday. Also, when I start to release some products, you might get a little, you know, a little something, something, a little extra love if you know what I'm sizzling. So definitely sign up for that. You'll also want to sign up for some of my services. If you want to work on improving your movement options, maybe you got a collapsed arch, and you want me to take you through some things to help with that. Um, I have not, Tyler, but I will. Um, or or maybe, eh, you know, you're trying some of this breathing stuff. Or you don't just have it right. Well, what I can do is I can take you through movement consultation. What we'll do is we'll look at your movement capabilities. I'll see if I can give you some activities to change those movement cap capabilities. And we'll get you in business. Or... Maybe you want to learn how to do that with your people, whether it's online, whether it's in person, whether you're a trainer or a coach, because the more movement you have available at all your joints, the less likely you are to have pain because it evens out the stress load throughout your body, or the, the better you're able to perform because then you can do more exercises to help you reach your, your fitness goals. Either way, I can teach you to do that with my mentorship program where we design and we, we look at how to integrate this stuff into your, um, your own practice. So you could definitely sign up for that. Or if you want to go to the next level and get big gains, then I can work on training with you online. What we'll do is I will perform a movement consultation to you. We will design a program specific to your movement needs so you can have the best exercise selection, one, and two, program this in such a manner that's going to help push you towards your health and performance goals. Once you're done with ZachCouples.com, you want to sign up for the Zach Couples show. It's either on iTunes or Stitcher, because guess what, folks? There's 83 other debriefs. I didn't have the beard for all of them, so maybe you want to, you know, listen to me instead of watch me. Definitely do that. I'm also all over social media. Facebook is forward slash ZCouples. The Twitter handle is at ZCouples. The Instagram baby is Zach Z-A-C, Couples C-U-P-P-L-E-S. And if you want a gang of exercises, see what I'm doing with the fam nowadays, go to YouTube, search Zach Couples, and we'll have you in business. I want to thank you so much for tuning in. You've been an amazing audience. Keep it real, but not to the extent where things go wrong. Stay hungry, stay learning, stay moving, and I'll see you next time. Deuces.